So I've presented what the Bible clearly states and your argument back to me in essence is, did God really say? Are you sure that's the hermeneutical approach you want to take to this topic? What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where on every episode, I am always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And today, we're going to tackle the topic of traditions of men. Stick around. So if you're part of an older denomination, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Lutheran, Anglican, you've often heard your Protestant friends respond to something that you believe, teach, and confess to be authentically Christian as, that's just a tradition of men. So today we're going to tackle the topic of traditions of men and we're going to find out who's actually guilty of teaching as doctrine the traditions of men. And if theology like this is something that you enjoy, then I highly recommend hitting that subscribe button, ringing the notification bell to stay up to date on when I post. And as always, there's a comment section below if you disagree, if you have comments, if you have suggestions. What are some traditions of men that you think we should talk about? That's what the comment section is for. But today we're talking about an interesting interesting topic as far as traditions of men. Infant baptism on the one hand and baby dedication on the other. That's what we're talking about. Now, we need to go to the scriptures to first understand where does this argument come from. And in my experience, and this is entirely anecdotal, it, it comes to me from my non-Lutheran family. And they will say, that's a tradition of men. What? Any number of things that I believe as a Lutheran or how I practice what I believe as a Lutheran, that's a tradition of men. Where are they getting this from? They're getting it from Matthew chapter 15. So let's turn to the word of God. It's right over here in front of me. And let's read from Matthew chapter 15. Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples break with the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He, being Jesus, answered them, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the traditions of men. Jesus is not condemning tradition. As a matter of fact, Jesus came into the Jewish faith. He is a Jew and they have many, many traditions which Jesus participated in even before he was old enough to his parents participated him in these traditions before he was old enough to cognitively participate in them himself. So Jesus does not condemn tradition. What does he condemn? A tradition that makes void the word of God. And so in that vein, we are going to look at infant baptism and baby dedications. Which one makes void the word of God. That's what Jesus is driving at. Not that, not that the disciples shouldn't wash their hands or can't wash their hands in this ceremonial way after being out in the world of the Gentiles. Not that they can't, but that they don't have to because this tradition violates God's word. Tradition is a good thing. Other places in the scriptures will describe for us that it is tradition by which the faith, once for all delivered to the saints, has been handed down to you and me. Tradition's not a bad thing. Now, where does the tradition of baby dedication come from? This might surprise a lot of Protestants. It doesn't actually come from the Bible. 
The tradition of baby dedication comes from about the 1520s AD when during the Lutheran Reformation, a counter-reformation occurred, the Protestant Reformation or the Radical Reformation. Now where Luther was pointing back to the ancient church and saying, hey, this is what the ancient church believed, taught, confessed, and this is how they practiced it. Can we do this? The, the Radical Reformation said, if the Roman Catholic Church does it, we're not doing it. So literally, when it comes to baptism, the Anabaptists of the Radical Reformation threw the baby out with the bathwater. And bathwater is not a bad way to describe baptism. It is a washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit. So this, 1500 years after the day of Pentecost and the birth of the Christian church, 1520 some years after that, we are introduced to the idea of not baptizing our children and rather dedicating them instead. Now you can see I'm wearing headphones here because I found a very quick and concise explanation of the thought pattern and modern Protestants behind infant baptism. So I'm going to load that up here. This is from Wretched Radio, which Take it or leave it. Now, I chose this clip for two reasons. One, it's short. And two, because Todd Friel is hes a lot of things, but he's intelligent and he's articulate. So I wanted someone who was intelligent and articulate to explain the point. So we're going to watch this and then we're going to talk about baby dedications and then we're going to compare it to baptism and we're going to find out which one is a tradition of mem. So let me get my headset on here. All right. Take her away, Todd. And kindly help me understand baby dedications. That is a great question. Now, it depends, of course, on what you mean by baby dedication. If you mean a baby baptism, baptismal regeneration, that if you sprinkle or pour some water on a baby and the baby gets saved, that... Uh, that's not biblical. Faith, then baptism. If you happen to be a Presbyterian and you believe that that baptismal ceremony brings the child into a protective covenant, while I would disagree with you, I wouldn't tell you, ho, 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 you're apostate and a heretic. I wouldn't say that to my Presbyterian brothers and sisters. So what exactly is a baby Dedication, I think it's an evangelical response <laughs> to seeing Presbyterians and people who believe in baptismal regeneration and doing some sort of ceremony for the kids. And so I think that we concocted something called a baby dedication. This is when mom and dad stand before the body and they vow to train up their child in the way that they should go. The congregation then also makes a promise to support them in that endeavor. And then back to their pew they go. No water is involved. It is merely a dedicating self and the, the child to training them up to love Jesus Christ. Is that biblical? We don't see that in the Bible, but is that sinful? Absolutely not. There is nothing sinful in doing a ceremony where everybody dedicates themselves to that chief endeavor of training up a child in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, as long as there's no salvific components. In other <laughs> words, we did that, therefore the kids go into heaven. No, that wouldn't be biblical, but baby dedications, they're fine. <laughs> They're fine. They're fine, he says. They're fine. Oh, so that's it. That is the best, clearest, most concise explanation of baby dedications that I could find. And even Todd Friel is going to admit this replaces something that is older. We don't want to baptize our babies. We don't believe in baptismal regeneration for children. Really what it boils down to is because of this Gnostic, I'm just going to call a spade a spade, this Gnostic idea that flesh bad, spirit good, anything that is a work or outside that is not internal into our heart man is bad, then baptism is a work. And think about it. 
Well, we go, we bring the child, there is a man there who holds the child, who says words, who pours water. This is a work. Uh huh. And we're saved by grace, not by works. Uh huh. See, Ryan? Baby dedication. Baptism is a work. And that's why we have to do the work of dedicating them instead. Because we're saved by grace, not by works. <laughs> well, I'm a Lutheran, so I'm going to turn to the small catechism for a very simple explanation of what is baptism, because that's the question. Not who should be baptized, what is baptism? So once we understand what baptism is, then it becomes painstakingly obvious who should be baptized. And it will explain why we see who we see being baptized in the book of Acts. So what is baptism? That's the first. That has to be the primary question. And the small catechism lays it out perfectly. What is baptism? Answer. Baptism is not simple water only, but it is the water comprehended in God's command and connected with God's word. Which is that word of God. Answer, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, go ye into all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. What is baptism? It is water comprehended in God's command and connected to God's word. That's what baptism is. It is water and God's word delivering to the recipient life, forgiveness, and salvation. Don't believe me? You still think baptism is your work, your act of obedience? What does Jesus say baptism is? Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul writes to us in Ephesians Chapter 5, painting this beautiful picture of a marriage, the relationship of husband and wife and how it is a type and a picture of the relationship that Christ has with us. Paul says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So is baptism a work? Yes. Whose work? Jesus' work. You see, the Gnostic in all of us, the Gnosticism that runs rampant in mainline American Protestantism, wants to hate on anything that comes from outside of us. It wants to hate works of the flesh. It's all super duper spiritual and, and, and emotional and I have my God feelings. It's all in here. But anything that's out here that comes to us from outside of us, that's a bad thing. So baptism is work. It's an act of obedience. I challenge you to find one Bible verse that says that about baptism and we're going to look at a couple. Baptism is a work, and it's Jesus' work. The work, okay, look, 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 look. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The cross, the crucifixion, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, that's a work. It's Christ's work. That, verse 26, he might sanctify her. How? So he did this work. How is he going to sanctify her? Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So how was salvation won? By the work of Christ on the cross. How does Christ deign to give it to you and to me? By sanctifying us by the washing of water with the word. Let's go back to the catechism, shall we? Baptism is not simple water only, but it is water comprehended in God's command and connected with God's word. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Hmm, it's almost like Luther's small catechism says the same thing the Bible does. So now we have an idea. What is baptism as far as it relates to being a work? It is Jesus' work, not 
ours, unlike a baby dedication, which is purely our work. Not even the baby's work, our work. We're doing... You can't speak on behalf of this child at a baptism, as you Lutherans like to do, because the baby has to make the decision. You can't speak on behalf of the child at a dedication. If it weren't for double standards when it comes to theology and traditions of men, I don't think Protestants would have any standards at all. But I digress. You see, it's, it's bad when you do this tradition of men, but it's okay when we do this tradition of men. Uh -huh. The logic of an Anabaptist, or uh, as they like to be called today, evangelicals. So let's go to a couple other Bible passages. Because... The other thing, and I know because I used to do this, because I wasn't always a Lutheran, when I used to argue against the Lutheran stance on baptism, non-denominationals, Baptists, Pentecostals, they're all Anabaptists in some way or another. They go to all of these verses that aren't about baptism in order to tell you about baptism. Like Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. See, not by works, baptism is a work. Right. But the Apostle Paul tells us that baptism is Jesus' work. And if Jesus does the work, it's good enough. To say that Jesus' work of baptism isn't efficacious is to say Jesus' work of sanctification on the cross isn't efficacious. Other people's works credited to us as righteousness is how God deigns to deal with you and me. God doesn't want to deal with you or me in any other means except by word and sacrament. He has accomplished for us justification. He delivers justification to us by word and sacrament. So, so we can't go to verses that aren't about baptism to find out what baptism is. So we go to verses about baptism. Acts 2, 38 through 39. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone, whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So this is spoken on the day of Pentecost in a sermon that no Christian would say is not under the direct influence of God the Holy Spirit. And what does he say? Baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. Baptism gives the gift of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is a promise. Baptism is for you. Baptism is for your children. Matter of fact, baptism is for everyone. So this tells us what baptism is and who it's for. Baptism is for the forgiveness of sins, for the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is a promise. Who, promise. Who is it for? Everyone, up to and including your children. Romans 6, 3-5. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. What is baptism? It is being buried with Christ into his death and raised with him in his resurrection to walk with newness of life. And if you think this is about dunking, you are wrong. We were buried, therefore, with him. How? By baptism. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. It is Christ who lives in me. When were we crucified with Christ? How were we buried with Christ? Romans 6, 3 through 5, by baptism. Colossians 2, 11 through 12. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now here is a comparison of baptism to circumcision. Baptism is the completion of circumcision. Circumcision in the Old Testament, which happened to babies on the eighth day, this baptism with water is now the fulfillment. This 
we see dimly in a mirror. Now that then we see fully revealed. This is an antitype, an archetype circumcision and it happened to babies and when the babies were circumcised by the act of circumcision by God's word attached to the act of circumcision and the shedding of blood they were made a part of God's people they were brought into a covenant relationship with him that he established so the baby can't make a decision to be circumcised and be brought into this covenant but God says, if you do this because I said to do it, this is the end result. And he says the same thing of baptism. If you do this, uh, this is what it is. You, are, you will receive forgiveness of sins. You will be buried and raised with my son. You will be filled with God the Holy Spirit. Acts 22.16, 2, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. These words spoken to Paul. This is the first thing he hears about baptism. What does it say? Be baptized and wash away your sins. And in Paul's later litany of those who do not inherit the kingdom of heaven, he lists it off and he says what? Does he say, and such were some of you, but you made a decision for the Lord. Ah, no. He says, but you were washed. You are not like these people because you are baptized. Titus 3, 4 through 7. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 1 Peter 3, 21 through 22. The one verse that no Anabaptist knows is in the Bible. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Baptism now saves you. And this is Peter. So Peter who said, and for your children, also says baptism now saves you. Now that we understand what baptism is, now we can look into the book of Acts and see who was baptized. Well, people who were preached to. We also see whole families who were baptized. And you love to make an argument of from silence that, well, it doesn't mention babies, right? And the Bible doesn't mention women communing either, does it? So, by your Protestant logic, women can't have communion because it's not expressly stated in the scriptures. However, it is highly implied. Of course, women would commune. They are part of the body of Christ. Of course, babies would be baptized. They are a part of a whole family. So we're not making an argument from silence that this means we have proof that babies were baptized. We're just explaining the reason for the silence. There, you don't need to say, and babies, because the first century mind would understand that what a family is. And we in the 21st century view families very differently. We have this narcissistic, individualistic approach to a family. Me, father, you, mother, you, children. No, in the first century, it was family. That was it, a single unit. So there's the reason behind the silence in the New Testament. Because you didn't need to explain to a first century Jew. Well, and yes, of course, babies. But we have Peter's own words and for your children. So the church knew this is for babies too. So when we look in the book of Acts, we see faith, we see salvation, we see receiving the Holy Spirit, always with baptism. And you cannot, because they do exist, you cannot point to the exception verses and normalize them. There are exception verses in the book of Acts where it happens 
differently, specifically regarding John's baptism and then those who have not received Jesus' baptism. This is what Peter means when he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Not, those are the words you have to use. Jesus himself gives us the words to use. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ is to be baptized into his baptism, not John's. So there is an example of John's baptism not receiving the Holy Spirit and but again, in the end, baptism, Holy Spirit, forgiveness of sins, life, forgiveness, salvation, all connected. They're always connected to each other in the book of Acts. Now we have baby dedication. Baby dedication came from the 1500s and it came about because, well, those dirty, rotten Catholics do it, so we're not gonna. Those dirty, rotten Catholics like to read scripture in church on Sunday, so we're not gonna. Those dirty, rotten Catholics like to sing hymns in church on Sunday, so we're not going to sing. Those dirty, rotten Catholics like to say the Lord's Prayer. Well, we're not going to. Do you see where I'm going with this kind of logic? Now, to wrap this all up, when I've argued for baptism as Jesus' work to us, and Jesus saving us, and Jesus washing us and sanctifying us by the washing and renewal of the Holy Spirit, the waters of regeneration. This is Jesus' work to us, which makes it entirely trustworthy and something to which faith can cling. I have been met with, what if? Or what about? Well, I know you read me that Bible verse, but what if this? Well, I know you read me that Bible verse, but what about that? Okay. So I've presented what the Bible clearly states and your argument back to me in essence is, did God really say? Are you sure that's the hermeneutical approach you want to take to this topic? We all heard Todd Friel say there's no evidence of a baby dedication in the Bible, in the New Testament. This is not biblical. This is a tradition of men. And it's a tradition of men meant to replace the former tradition. But the former tradition, the tradition of baptizing your babies, comes to us from Jesus himself. It's revealed to us that baptism is for children, just as it is anyone else. Jesus himself says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. What does he mean? Babies, if you've ever had them, I've had a couple. Babies are really good at receiving. That's it. That's all they're good at. Receiving and crying. So what they put forth is aggravating as hell. But they receive really well. And f they, they are the picture of faith. They simply receive. They receive love, they receive affection, they receive care, they receive milk, they receive cleansing, they receive clothes, they receive kisses. That's what Jesus wants us to be like. Not people who go out and grab for ourselves and make a decision. No. Jesus wants us to become like little children and receive. So, which one is the tradition of men that Jesus would condemn? Because remember, Jesus says, teaching as doctrine the traditions of men. Well, as a Lutheran, I teach as doctrine baptism and withhold it from no one. Baptism is for everyone. Versus the Anabaptists, or as they like to be called today, evangelicals. Whereas baptism is not for everyone. Ergo, we must invent this tradition to replace what had gone before. Hmm, I wonder which one is a vain tradition of men. Hmm, that's a head scratcher. If you have any ideas on what might be considered a vain tradition of men in the Christian church today, leave a comment in the comment section below. And until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.